I'm gonna ask everyone to go ahead and mute. Hand it over to Bobby. There you go, Bobby. All right, good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. This is our book. We're gonna be reading a little bit more about Helen Keller, okay? Just like we did with Harriet Tubman, we read more than one book. So you get a, um, um, a fuller picture of the person when you come at it from different perspectives. Okay, so this is by Christina Platt. And it's very nicely illustrated. And as usual, there's some real photographs of her in the back. Well, let's start with chapter one. As a child, Helen Keller loved eating hot dogs and sweet treats. She also loved playing with her family dog, Belle, and making ice cream with her friend, Martha. Helen's childhood might sound ordinary, but it wasn't. That's because something happened early in Helen's life that would make her extraordinary. Helen was born on June 27, 1880 in a small town of Tuscoma, Alabama. She was a healthy baby, but when she was just 19 months old, Helen got sick with a mysterious illness. Some historians believe it was scarlet fever and it changed her life forever. Once she got better, Helen could no longer see or hear. This disability is known as being death blind. In the 1800s, many people believed that death blind children couldn't learn to read or write. But today, deaf blind people all around the world are educated and have wonderful lives. This is the illustration of, of Helen. Helen proved that it could be done. She overcame every challenge to become a famous humanitarian, educator, author, and civil rights leader. And this shows you in Alabama, it's Tennessee, where she was born, that little dot. Okay. When Helen was born, America was still recovering from the Civil War. And we read about the Civil War with Harriet Tubman. And she was a slave and before the Civil War. And then Harriet kept going back to rescue people and bring them north to escape slavery. The war began in 1861 and lasted four years. The Southern states used enslaved people as free labor and wanted to keep doing so. The Northern states believed that slavery was unfair and needed to end. The Northern Union Army defeated the Southern Confederate Army and the war ended on April the 9th, 1865 and slavery was abolished. After the war, Helen's hometown of Tuscoma was nothing like the small thriving town it had once been. Before a railroad had run through it, but the railroad was destroyed in the war. The Kellers had used slave laborers on their cotton plantation. So her family or parents actually used slaves for, to do their work. And that's what Harriet Tubman was escaping from, if you remember. After the war, they could not enslave people anymore. So the Kellers weren't poor, but they weren't as wealthy either as they had been. If, Formerly enslaved woman named Miss Washington worked as the Keller's family cook, and her daughter Martha would play a special role in Helen's life. Despite Helen's illness that caused her to become deaf blind, she accomplished many things. Her determination to learn and succeed changed the way people thought about disabilities. Let's learn more about Helen and why she is often called the First Lady of Courage. Here's a picture of her hometown. And it's not as busy as it used to be after the Civil War. Growing up in Tuscoma, Alabama, Helen's father, Captain Arthur Henley Keller, fought with the Confederate Army. After the war, he worked as an editor for the local paper. And there's her parents, and they're holding Helen in her mom's lap. And there's a picture of their house. Their mother, her mother was the daughter of a Confederate general. The Kellers had three children together, Helen, her younger brother, Philip, and her younger sister, Mildred. Helen also had two older half brothers, James and William. And there they are playing. And that's before Helen got that illness that caused her to lose her hearing and her sight. The Keller family lived on a plantation that Helen's grandfather had built many years before. Helen's aunt Evelyn lived with them too. 
The Keller's family property was known as Ivy Green and it was very beautiful. Ivy Green had more than 640 acres of farmland, which is the size of about 480 football fields. There was a lot of room to grow crops and raise livestock. There was also a lot of room for the Keller children to run and play. There were plenty of trees to climb and the garden had lovely flowers like roses and honeysuckles. There was a little college at Ivy Green, a short walk from the main house. One day, this beautiful little cottage would become a special place for Helen. When Helen was 19 months old, she became very sick and her parents didn't know what to do. And there's just a picture of her father right by her bed. Even the doctors didn't know what was wrong. Their medicine did not help Helen get better. And soon little Helen had a very dangerous high fever and everyone was afraid she wouldn't live. It was a miracle that Helen survived this mysterious illness. But once she got better, her parents noticed that she wasn't the same playful toddler. Helen started bumping into things as so she couldn't see. And they realized the fever had caused Helen to become blind. Whenever anyone called to Helen, she couldn't hear them either. And soon they realized Helen was also deaf. She had lost her sense of hearing. Helen was deaf blind. Because there was no cure for being deafblind, everyone felt very sorry for Helen. Her family didn't know how they could talk to her or how she would learn, but Helen would surprise everyone as she overcame the challenges of being unable to see and hear. And there's a picture of her and she's holding her doll and she looks very sad. Helen had always been a very smart toddler. She could speak a few words and walk by the age of one. But Helen's new world was dark and silent. No one knew how Helen felt. And even though her family loved her, she often felt alone. Whenever Helen got frustrated, she had a temper tantrum. She never got in trouble because everyone felt sorry for her. Sometimes Helen's parents even gave her candy to calm her down. This only made her behavior worse. It was like she was getting a reward. Helen was also jealous of her new baby sister, Mildred, and she often had tantrums to make her parents, to take her parents' attention away from the baby, Mildred. By the time Helen was five years old, she was a wild, disobedient child. Helen used her hands to let people know what she wanted. When she needed her mother, she put her hand on her cheek, and she often played with the family cook's daughter, Martha Washington. Martha was one of the first people who understood Helen's hand gestures. And together, the two girls created a secret language of more than 60, 60 hand gestures. And there they are. They're, they're talking to each other by the use of their hands. As Helen grew older, she used her sense of smell and touch to understand the world. For example, her father's footsteps were heavier than her mother's. Helen knew who was walking nearby by how softly or heavily the floorboards vibrated under their feet. Helen's family was grateful she discovered these things, but they really wanted doctors to help her see and hear again. Every doctor said the same thing. Helen's sight and hearing could not be fixed. By the time Helen was six years old, her parents had almost given up hope. One day, Helen's mother learned about a woman named Laura Brigman. Like Helen, Laura became deaf blind after a childhood illness, but Laura had learned to read and live a happy life. Helen's parents decided to try one more doctor, a man named Dr. Julian Chisholm. He lived in Baltimore, which was far from Tuscoma. They hoped Dr. Chisholm could help Helen, so they went to meet him. And there's Helen, and there's Dr. Chisholm. But unfortunately, Dr. Chisholm could not help Helen, but he knew someone who could, Alexander Graham Bell. Mr. Bell was famous for inventing the telephone, but he also worked with deaf children. The Kellers met with him in Washington, DC. He knew about a special school, the Perkins Institute for the Blind. It's where Laura received her education. Mr. Bell told the Kellers to contact the school's director, Michael Noskos. Finally, there was hope for Helen. In their letter to Mr. Nakas, the Kellers asked a teacher for Helen. A few weeks later, they received wonderful news. A 
a teacher had been found, a woman named Ann Sullivan. And there's a picture of her new teacher, okay? Ann Sullivan traveled more than a thousand miles from Boston, Massachusetts to Tacoma, Alabama. When she arrived on March the 3rd, 1887, the Kellers learned that Ann also had a sight disability. She wasn't blind, but her vision was impaired. She could only see well enough to read if she used special glasses that were very heavy and very uncomfortable. Shortly after she arrived, Anne gave Helen a gift, a doll. She used sign language to spell the letters D-O-L-L -L in the palm of Helen's hand. Helen was very confused. She knew what a doll was, but she did not know the word doll. Frustrated, Helen had a tantrum. She pinched and she hit Ann Sullivan many times, but unlike her parents, Ann did not give Helen candy to calm her down. For the next lesson, Ann gave Helen a mug. She signed M-U-G in the palm of Helen's hand. This time, Helen was so frustrated, she broke the mug. Anne tried to teach Helen, but she had a tantrum every time. Anne did not blame Helen. It was hard to learn sign language. The next morning, Helen walked around the room and ate other people's breakfast with her hands. The Kellers did not stop her. Anne couldn't believe it. She told the Kellers the first thing Helen needed to learn was how to be obedient. During the walk, Helen saw a beautiful little cottage on the Kellers property. She had an idea. Because Helen's parents loved and felt sorry for her, they kept allowing Helen's bad behavior. But Helen needed some time away from them. What if Helen could live with Anne for a short time in the cottage? At first, Helen's parents did not like the idea, but eventually they agreed. They took Helen on a long carriage ride to make her think she traveled far away. At the cottage, Anne taught Helen how to behave. She also continued the sign language lessons, and it worked. Soon Helen stopped throwing tantrums and started copying Anne's sign language. Even though Helen copied Anne, she didn't yet understand that things had names. She could make signs, but she didn't know what they meant. One day, Anne and Helen walked to the well. Anne pumped water over one of Helen's hands and signed the letters W-A-T-E-R in the other. Suddenly, Ellen had the connection. She was so excited. And with hours, within just a short time, she learned almost 30 new words. Soon Helen knew hundreds of words. She even tried to teach her dog sign language, but Belle preferred to take a nap. Then Anne began teaching Helen how to read. Books for the visually impaired are printed with raised ink, so readers can trace the letters with their fingers. Helen also learned how to read in Braille, a form of writing where raised dots represent letters. Helen loved to read. She discovered stories and myths and facts about the world around her. Many children and teachers might have given up, but Helen was determined to learn, and Anne was determined to teach her. Before she was even a teenager, Helen had achieved what many people thought was impossible. With Anne by her side, she was just getting started. And here's a picture of her reading a book with Braille. Okay, those raised dots that Kate was showing us. Newspapers began publishing stories about Anne and Helen. Even President Grover Cleveland wanted to meet this amazing woman. Along with Anne, Helen visited the White House before she was 10 years old. She would meet more than a dozen presidents in her lifetime. Visiting the White House was great, but there was one place Helen really wanted to go the Perkins Institute for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts. Both Laura and Anne went to school there and Helen wanted to do the same. In 1888, Helen and Anne traveled to Boston. Anne had become more than Helen's teacher. She was her guardian and most trusted friend. And together they explored Boston. The large city was so different from Tuscoma. Helen enjoyed taking in the new smells and eating Northern food. And there's a picture of them looking at the Perkins School. Okay. Helen felt like she'd finally found her place in the world at Perkins. Everyone there was just like her. Helen and her new friends used sign language to communicate. They also read books in Braille. Helen studied many subjects, and English was one of her favorite classes. 
especially when they read poetry. Helen discovered she also loved to write and she often created her own stories and poems. In March, 1890, Helen learned about a deaf blind girl who lived in Norway. This girl had learned to speak. Helen couldn't believe it. She knew her family spoke with their mouths. It was one of the reasons she had tantrums as a child because she wanted to speak like them. And if another deaf blind girl had learned to speak, Helen was determined to do the same. At first, Anne didn't think it was a good idea. Helen could not hear the words, so how could she learn to speak? Helen's goal seemed impossible, but she refused to take no for an answer. Finally, Anne agreed she would try to teach Helen how to talk. The Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing was also in Boston. Anne took Helen to meet the principal, Sarah Fuller, and Miss Fuller offered to help Helen. Miss Fuller placed Helen's fingers on her lips and throat. Here's a picture of her. Okay, so there's her teacher and there's Helen touching Mrs. Fuller's lips. She's gonna also be touching her throat for the vibrations. When Miss Fuller spoke, Helen could feel the vibrations of each word. After 11 lessons with Miss Fuller, Anne continued to teach Helen. Learning speech was so hard, but Helen often became frustrated because of that. But thanks to Anne, she had grown out of having tantrums. Helen continued to practice and soon she could make her first sounds. Then when she was 10, Helen spoke her first sentence. It is too warm. She had set a huge goal for herself and she had reached it. In 1894, Anne took Helen to New York City to attend the Wright Human Mason School for the Deaf. Helen was the only student there who was deaf and blind. Okay, so there it is. They're walking around New York City. Okay, lots of things to smell. Okay, can't hear, but to touch and feel and to taste. She signed the words into Helen's hands. And meanwhile, Helen continued learning to speak. Helen was 13 years old. And like most teenagers, she wanted to explore New York City. Helen learned much about the city through her sense of smell and touch. And although she had fun, Helen found it was too busy. When Helen finished her schooling at the Wright Humans in school, she set her next goal. She wanted to attend college. But during this time, some people thought women should not go to college. College seemed impossible for a woman who was also deafblind. And Helen's mother thought she was too young. Even Anne agreed. But once Helen set her mind to do something, she wouldn't be stopped. Helen's mother agreed under one condition. Helen had to go to boarding school to get ready for college. In 1896, Helen enrolled in the Cambridge School for Young Ladies. There she studied for her college entrance exams. Helen wanted to go to Harvard University, but at the time only men were allowed. So Helen applied to Harvard School for Women, Radcliffe College. She was nervous waiting to find out as she got in. Then one day a letter arrived from Radcliffe College. Helen was accepted and she couldn't wait to begin. And there she is, okay. You can see they're sitting together, Anne and Helen, and Anne is signing into Helen's hand the lectures that Anne can hear, but Helen can't. Radcliffe College was just outside of Boston, and like the other schools that Helen had attended, her class classmates at Radcliffe could see and hear, and none of Helen's textbooks were available in Braille, so Anne read and translated them. She also attended classes with Helen and translated the professor's lectures. College classes weren't easy. They were extra hard for Helen because she was deaf blind. Most other students could review their textbooks and class notes, but Helen had to memorize everything. She had to work so much harder in order to succeed. Of course, Helen did just that. She got excellent grades, even outsmarting some of her classmates. Helen had loved studying English in grade school, but she still enjoyed English classes in college. Mr. Charge Copeland, taught English at Radcliffe. He thought Helen's writing was fantastic. Mr. Copeland encouraged Helen to write more, especially about her experiences as a deaf blind person. Helen used a typewriter to write. Okay, there she is. That's an old fashioned typewriter, long before computers, okay? She memorized the location of each letter. They had the same placement as the letters on today's keyboards and laptops. Many people were surprised that Helen could type faster than people who could see. 
Helen had always enjoyed writing stories and poetry. With the encouragement of Mr. Copeland, she began to write more about her life and experiences as a deaf blind woman. Some of Helen's stories and articles were published. In 1903, Helen wrote her first book, The Story of My Life. The autobiography followed the journey of Helen's life from childhood through becoming a student at Radcliffe. Of course, Helen spoke throughout the book of her love and appreciation for her teacher, Anne. The book was very successful. It is still read by people all over the world today. The Story of My Life was the first book Helen wrote, but it wouldn't be the last. Helen would go on to write a dozen books. As the people read The Story of My Life, Helen became more and more famous. Everyone from doctors to world leaders wanted to meet her. She even made friends with the famous writer, Mark Twain. Helen's classmates admired her too. In 1902, they gave her a special gift. After learning that one of Helen's beloved dogs had passed away, her classmates gave her a new pet, a Boston Terrier named Sir Thomas. And there they are. And we all know how special our pets are to us. Despite her growing fame, Helen continued to study at Radcliffe. In 1904, Helen did something no deaf blind person had ever done. She graduated from college. Not only was Helen the first deaf blind person to earn a college degree, she also graduated with high honors. This success wasn't the last of Helen's achievements. She still had more things to do. After graduating from Radcliffe, Helen's work wasn't done. She knew she'd accomplished so much because she was privileged. Helen's parents were wealthy, so they could hire Anne as her teacher. But Helen believed that everyone had a right to be, educated, to be educated. She became an activist dedicated to helping people with disabilities. Helen often traveled to share her life story. She explained that people with disabilities could learn if given the right opportunities. She also helped people with disabilities she met at her lectures, offering them encouragement and guidance. By the early 1900s, Helen was a well-known advocate for people with disabilities. And she's right in the classroom with children. Okay. And she it sounds like she's showing them how to read in Braille. Okay. She even testified before Congress, which is responsible for governing the nation. Helen told Congress that it was important to improve the lives of blind people. A year later, the president signed a new law that helped give books in Braille to people who needed them. In 1915, Helen created her own organization, the Helen Keller International Society. She worked with a man named George Kessler, a very successful businessman, and together they tried to end some of the causes of blindness, such as malnutrition. And then in 1920, Helen helped create one of America's most important organizations, the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. More than 100 years later, the ACLU continues to protect the rights of every American. Helen continued to travel and to speak out about her views even when others disagreed. For example, she advocated for women having the right to vote and Anne continued to support and encourage her. And there's Helen. It's like she's boarding an airplane and waving to people. Okay. In 1836, Anne Sullivan became very ill. When she passed away on October 20th, Helen was there holding her hand. They'd been nearly inseparable for almost 50 years. Of course, Helen was devastated by Anne's death and she felt very lonely, but she knew Anne would have wanted her to continue her important work. Helen had many roles in her lifetime, but one of the biggest came in 1946, when Helen became a counselor on international relations for the American Foundation for Overseas Blind. For the next 10 years, she traveled to 35 countries to help raise awareness about blindness. One of these trips included a 40,000 mile, five month tour across Asia, when Helen was 75 years old. Helen received many honors, and in 1936, she received the Theodore Roosevelt Distinguished Service Medal. In 1964, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 1961, Helen became ill and she began to spend more time in her home in Connecticut. In 1965, she was elected to the National Women's Hall of Fame. And when Helen passed away on June 1st, 1968, she was buried at a special memorial at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C right next to her teacher and best friend, Anne Sullivan. 
Collins life continues to serve as an inspiration for overcoming challenges to achieve great things. Helen's determination changed not only her whole life, but also the lives of millions of people with disabilities. She forever changed the world we live in today by advocating for equality for everyone. Helen Keller remains one of the most celebrated women in history. And here's Helen. So it's a picture of her and one of her dogs. It's a young lady. There's a picture of her and her teacher, Anne. Okay. Only two photographs that we have. We do. Okay. So that's more information, a lot more information about Helen Keller and her life. Okay. So I know we'll be asking you questions about her being an inspiration, certainly to me, to learn that such a, a person could overcome so much. All right. You guys, I'm just going to check my time because I have one more beautiful book that I found in Florida. Ah, I don't, you know what? I'm going to show you the book, but I think it's getting too late to read it because it, it's a little bit long. It's this one. It's about a seahorse and about everything he's discovering in the ocean around him and about how he's the papa that carries his babies right in his pouch. But it's long and it's beautiful and I want you to enjoy it. So we're going to save it for next week. Okay. So Ms. Carmen, I'm going to. Yes. Thank you so out. much, Bobby. Okay. Yeah. Um, we just want to say thank you for doing book club, Bobby. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. We have so much fun listening and Who's learning there? from you. That's the hostess. And I see Carmen? that. Hi. Uh, we're all going to say bye to Bobby and we can all say thank you to Bobby. Ed, do you have a question first? Are you Thanks in? Thanks very Bobby? much. <coughs> all right. Well, thank you. you're welcome. Thank you very everybody. much. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Next Bye. week. Thank you, Bobby. Welcome. I want to say happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Don't forget, today is Valentine's Day. It's not always about you know a spouse. It's about friends and family yes. too. Sharing Anybody is caring. You love. <laughs> yes, sharing is caring. I like that, Bobby. All right, bye, guys. I'll see you all okay. soon. Bye. Thank you Take so care. much. Bye. I hate.